imagining to Fisher before, um, as we as I signed on, that uh, how uh, substantive and fascinating I thought the chapters were for today, and uh, the book really builds, I think, in terms of the, the breadth and depth of analysis. And uh, I think in these chapters we see Roger Scruton confronting. Uh, not only popular culture and its relationship to what we might call a decayed modernism, one of the themes I think of the last several chapters, but also I think a uh, impressive familiarity. This is not Roger's world, the world of uh, popular culture, but it's also a world he's, I think, uh, perfectly familiar with and a world whose connection to the larger trends of desacralization, what Nietzsche called the death of God, is um, quite apparent. So I think there's, a, there's an awful lot of interest here. Um, and uh, these chapters, of course, prepare us for what we might call uh, Scruton's frontal assault in the final chapters on the culture of repudiation, especially in its uh, radical postmodernist form, the, re the absolute rejection of uh, any foundations for the true, the good, and the beautiful, and certainly the reduction not only of art and literature and culture to um, self-expression at best and uh, just pure repudiation at worst, but also this idea that everything human beings do, think, and create is simply a reflection of will to power. So one way of looking at that, of course, is for the last uh, 70 years or so, uh, progressive thought, elite thought has really been a kind of vulgarized combination of Marx and Nietzsche. Now, Marx and Nietzsche are not supposed to go together, but that mixture of will to power with um, uh, revolutionary politics or uh, the, the complete rejection of the existing order is as I said a second ago, um, in a way, the dominant paradigm of uh, late modern thought. All right, um, I thought I would just begin very briefly, more briefly than I did last time, by picking up with a couple of the themes at the very end of the chapter on modernism. And I wanna do this because I think it'll help us um, follow um, the, the principal themes of these chapters on, on, uh, on, on Kitsch and on um, uh, really sort of the decay of modernism that, uh, that Roger covers in the three chapters assigned for today. Um, if you remember chapter seven, uh, the chapter on modernism ends with a contrast between uh, Friedrich Nietzsche and T.S. Eliot. It's a very interesting contrast because as Scruton says in the middle of page 81, the solution which Nietzsche impetuously embraced was to deny the sovereignty of truth altogether, to hold that there are, there are no truths and to build the philosophy of life on the ruins of both science and religion in the name of a purely aesthetic ideal. Now, is there's no doubt that Nietzsche's formulation of this problem and the solution he proffers is much more radical than the high modernists of the first half of the 20th century. But, um, but like, uh, like Nietzsche, the high modernists have a certain confidence that one can resist nihilism by holding on to a purely aesthetic ideal. If we go back to the earlier chapters, we see that Scruton is convinced, I think with very good reason, that there's an intimate connection between culture and the sacred. And once that's separated and divorced, then a kind of spiritual emptiness, if not out and out nihilism, haunts culture. Culture becomes as I said before, one form of self-expression or one form of unrelenting um, repudiation. But uh, Scruton turns to Eliot because in a way Eliot is facing the, you know, his turn to high modernism. He's facing the same 
quandaries Nietzsche is, but instead Eliot turns to a path of discovery through poetry, um, which um, tries to return to the Christian faith, uh, not so much through dogma or some propositional affirmation, but for a renewed and self-conscious reaffirmation of belonging, of home, of a culture, uh, what uh, Scruton calls an imaginative homecoming that has, that perhaps, and this is sort of a bet of Eliot's, perhaps will once again reconnect the local and the placeless, the present and the timeless, uh, the pos uh, a possession of communities sanctified by history, but also transcending history through prayer. So those are really two very different uh, ways of responding to our postmodernist dilemma, or you might say the dilemma provoked by the death of God. And I don't mean the death of God in some meta metaphysical sense, but I mean the loss of faith, the, the withdrawing roar of faith that Matthew Arnold spoke about in the 1880s in um, his great poem, uh, Dover Beach. Um, and um, I think I, I just want to conclude that brief overview of uh, the conclusion of chapter seven by noting that I think Scruton stands in some ambivalence toward the modernist project. On the one hand, he clearly admires the effort to hold on to some spiritual account of art and literature and high culture, even without an explicit ground in the sacred or religion. He explicitly says we should revere our modernist heroes, that they were, they still, and this is really the difference between the phenomena and artists and photographers and thinkers highlighted in chapters eight, nine, and 10, they still self-consciously saw the essential connection between the cult, culture and the sacred, even if they were not, for the most part, believers in any traditional sense. We already discussed Wagner and Parsifal in that context. But chapter seven ends with um, a reflection on how the high modernist project has increasingly played itself out. Um, and uh, and I, I want to quote from the uh, final sentences of chapter seven, the top of page 84. He says, you know, the sort of the grave of, uh, of, uh, of traditional culture of the sacred, of uh, of the, the, the sacral roots of Western civilization are less and less visited. They were still visited and to some extent dialectically embraced by the high modernists. But Scruton adds, without the religious motive and the ingrained reverence toward a sacred text, the trouble demanded by whole high culture seems an excessive price to pay for its dubious privilege. Um, and, uh, and that leads, of course, to the question of whether or not the whole enterprise of the humanities today is capable of any kind of meaningful self-justification. So um, one doesn't have to agree with all of Roger Scruton's specific judgments, although I tend to agree with most of them, but to say that he, I think he describes the situation facing culture, facing the humanities today, I think in a, in a very accurate, but also evocative way. All right, so um, if we leave high modernism behind, we enter into the theme of chapter eight, the avant-garde, and Kitsch. Uh, it's interesting, Kitsch is not a, a, I mean, we're all familiar with the phenomenon, uh, 
the mixture of the sentimental and the gaudy, ga uh, gaudy and the ostentatious. And Scruton uh, has some nice discussions about how so much of what was left of modernist culture and art and literature was sort of an effort to, to uh, reject the lowbrow, to maintain some aesthetic ideal against the vulgar uh, or even the grotesque. But um, as I think scrutiny nicely does, so much of postmodernist thought and uh, art and literature and culture is uh, a kind of combines uh, you know, this desire for transgression, you know, as the French say, le, le, le bourgeois, you know, to shock the, the middle classes, shock the bourgeoisie with um, um, a kind of parodic affirmation of kitsch. Uh, I, I like Scruton's image of the quotation marks, you know, postmodern theorists are always uh, putting things in quotation marks. Well, they're putting kitsch in quotation marks, you know. And, and the more the, the modernist, late modernist, postmodernist enterprise is severed from either, even the remembrance of high culture or sacral things, the more it has to sort of play act. Uh, it, has to, uh, it has to fill its time and fill its activities with um, you know, some kind of ironic, um, uh, affirmation of what it first rejected and now it upholds in a, in a, uh, uh, in a, in a certain way. So um, clearly what's been lost is the modernist effort to maintain a sharp distinction between their high aesthetic ideals and the vulgarity of popular culture. Um, I also think Scruton makes very clear that um, once the, the to, to return to a theme that recurs in the book, um, once the connection between culture and the sacred is severed, even if that connection is primarily through memory or finding an art and culture a self-conscious substitute for the truth of the sacred. What's going to fill its gap is not only these uh, transgressive and pretending efforts of kitsch and the avant-garde, but um, various spasms of, that's uh, Scruton's word from page 86, various spasms of sentimentality, faux religiosity, ersatz religion, and even political religion. And, I, you know, Scruton very suggestively on the first half of page 86 suggests that today intellectuals and the young who are looking at what is fashionable or progressive, um, they, um, they find it in some visceral collective feeling that, uh, as Scruton very poetically puts it, swamps the psyche and drowns the grief of solitude. Because as Scruton adds, human beings are social animals, as the classics and medieval saw so well. And that, des that uh, desire to live in community will not abate, but it can take perverse forms when the when these ideological substitutes uh, crowd out the authentic affirmations of a culture and belonging. And so um, Scruton talks not only about substitute religions, new age fantasies. Chesterton used to say whenever in the 1920s or 30s he would debate a free thinker or atheist, he said they were all superstitious. They had their rabbit, uh, foot or they had this or that, you know, and, uh, uh, but, but this sort of uh, these substitute religions that combine uh, sentimentality with some, you know, call for heroic or transfiguring passions, um, these can take annoying and relatively harmless forms in the, uh, 
in the, uh, you know, this, you, I hear it from my students all the time that uh, they're spiritual and not religion, you know, this sort of amorphous and quasi empty spirituality that substitutes for the discipline and thought and tradition of authentic transcendental religion. But then you have the, um, the open uh, repressive totalitarian uh, secular religions that culminated in communism and fascism and the art and culture that accompanied that, the awful socialist realism, which had nothing realistic about it, but you know, uh, celebrations of stack of night workers who had met their production levels or uh, the Nuremberg, you know, I think uh, Reisenthal, um, uh, The Triumph of the Will is such a perplexing piece of art because she had immense talent but she used it to celebrate the, um, the uh, mystique of totalitarian organization and the cult of the Fuhrer at, uh, at Nuremberg in 1934. So um, I think Scruton's larger point is when high culture and the sacred are rejected and even actively eviscerated by the dominant currents of thought and culture, the loss of faith is going to be filled with what he calls fake emotions, fake morality, and fake aesthetic values. And a beautiful, a beautiful alliterative, alliterative phrase. Um, and I think for this reason, I, I, I think Scruton sees that this loss of faith eventually infected not only popular culture in all the ways I just um, summarized, but um, with the loss of what Scruton calls the background of a remembered faith, like Wagner's Parsifal, um, or even Eliot, a remembered faith that is renewed through the reaffirmation of sacred poetry, um, modernism becomes routinized and it becomes cliche written. And then it becomes tied to the culture of repudiation, to the phenomena of epatela, the bourgeoisie. Art must always give offense. It must always transgress. It must always challenge bourgeois taste. Um, and even this endless desire for the new, for the unexpected, for the avant-garde itself becomes paradoxically, and I think this is the, the central argument of the beginning of chapter eight, avant-garde and kitsch, it, it itself becomes a form of paradoxical uh, kitsch, it becomes shorn of the real contents of the soul and contents of life. Um, and so this group goes on to say, it's true that the old modernist project survived. It survived as a kind of memory, but shorn of its memory of the sacred, but it survived because of the official arts and culture establishment. Of course, in the Western world and the, in the Anglo-American world, we don't have ministries of culture. We leave that to the old communist bloc and to France. France has what Mark Fumilari called the etat culturel, the culture state, the ministry of cultures. De Gaulle's ministry of culture for uh, 15 years was André Marot, uh, the great art historian and a novelist and a very prominent intellectual. And uh, uh, But we don't, have, we don't have ministries of culture in the Anglo-American world or the Anglosphere the English speaking democracies as Churchill called them, but we do have a cultural establishment. We do have uh, the people who fund the stuff and modernism sort of even elements of high modernism persisted for a while because what else was there for the artistic or aesthetic establishment to support. But <clears throat> I think Scruton is very effective in showing that once this modernist ethos is institutionalized, 
um, it inevitably loses its character as a aesthetic attempt to recover and sustain the tradition. Um, Scruton makes, I think, a very effective and persuasive point along the way that various forms of postmodernist culture and art can imitate traditional art and music, but not with sincerity or authenticity. The imitation is a form of pretense. In other words, you're not engaging in the same enterprise of just think if you speak as, let's say, Alexander Solzhenitsyn did in his Nobel lecture in 1974 about um, the intrinsic connection between the true, the good, and the beautiful, or the artist as a humble apprentice and under God's heaven and not, uh, and not uh, you know, a creator of new worlds ex nihilo, you're considered to be hopelessly antiquated and naive. And uh, uh, so this is the problem. While forms of traditional representation might persist, they, per they persist in a ironic way or as a, um, uh, a form of imitation and not as uh, something motivated by, you might say, that spiritual quest for truth and beauty. <coughs> All right, there's an awful lot going on in all three of these chapters. Um, for example, I'm no expert on modern art, although I pay attention, but um, Scruton has, I think, some um, very intelligent discussions of how in expressionist and later, particularly in abstract, postmodern abstraction, uh, you see the triumph, the eventual triumph of the construct over the abstract. And he says, this is one very powerful effect of the routinization of modernism. So uh, you, have the, you have, again, this world of pretense. You have an official style of the avant-garde establishment, very much an orthodoxy or an official style. At the same time, it ritualistically uh, talks about the need for repudiation and transgression. So um, I think the point of this analysis, as I understand it, is that when art aims to construct and not represent reality, it no longer has life as its model. It is really built according to a system. And uh, Scruton suggests, for example, you know, a lot of modern intellectuals, artists, that they denounce technological society. But what's more technological than this? Understanding art as a construct uh, that has itself as a model and not life. You know, the construct becomes a kind of end in itself. And, um, and it loses form. Scruton talks about how constructionist paintings seldom come with frames because there isn't sort of a world to represent, even imaginatively, but instead there's simply what Scruton calls the routinization of modernist gestures. Uh, the escape from kitsch becomes a new form of nihilistic and postmodernist kitsch. Uh, uh, Scruton points out, for example, 100, he wrote in this book in 1998, said 100 years ago, African art had nothing to do with kitsch, but he says now it's all about kitsch. So there's, um, uh, he says it's not very difficult in a globalized world to transmit the disease. Those are hard words, but I think if you follow Scruton's analysis closely, it's not hard to see that, uh, that there is something pathological about this degeneration of culture into pretense, kitsch, ideology, transgression, repudiation. Um, that one's really dealing with a kind of fantasy world 
Um, I wanted to point out a passage on page 92 that brings us back to T.S. Eliot's high modernism and affirmation of English tradition and the Anglo-Catholic religious tradition. Um, Scruton wonders at the top of page 92 whether something like Eliot's pilgrimage is still available today. Um, by the way, I don't think he means religious faith isn't available today, because that clearly was not his position. But what he means is that the tie between culture and the sacred, but the, the kind of poetry that Eliot uh, put forward to, re, to, to, to instantiate the connection between the time and timeless. He says, it's less and less found in even the most ostensibly traditional religion. Or as he puts it, religion itself today has largely become kitsch. And he gives some examples, the lamentable modernization of the Catholic mass, uh, being a Roman Catholic myself, uh, you, I think you see liturgical delirium all around us. And now, you know, the remnants of the Latin mass are under threat from Rome a after Pope Benedict had done his best to sort of uh, support, you know, that effort to rekindle uh, the beautiful and holiness of liturgy. The Anglican uh, prayer book and the Book of Common Prayer have been, depending on your point of view, they have been made more demotic or vulgarized. Or, uh, the day-to-day -day services of Christian churches, uh, and I quote Scruton because he's so eminently quotable, are embarrassing reminders of the fact that religion is losing its sublime godwardness. So that's a really disheartening analysis and evaluation because it suggests that um, a kind of high modernist return to tradition and faith is less available now that the churches have lost their self-consciousness and are all their, their self-confidence and are more and more, uh, you might say, complicit in the destruction of what uh, Irving Babbitt called moral imagination. Um, lots of other things to say about chapter eight. Uh, Scruton has an eloquent discussion that I've already alluded to to what he calls preemptive kitsch. Um, uh, as he nicely puts it, putting quotation marks around actual, actual kitsch. Uh, he talks about the, uh, this is a really nice phrase, the institutionalized flippancy of so much of culture today. Um, culture, especially art and literature have been more and more divorced from any notion of required knowledge, competence, discipline, and study, and they more and more become idiosyncratic and sometimes empty expressions of self exp uh, uh, expressions of the self, whatever that is. Uh, I don't mean the soul, but this idea that somehow art is about self expression, self expression that is beyond judgment, that is beyond any um, hierarchy of goods or taste or anything of the sort. Let me read the final paragraph of chapter eight. Um, this chapter has traced the history of visual art since modernism. It's a nice summary paragraph. The modernists tried to rescue high art from the sea of fake emotion sentimentality, kitsch, but the new barriers with which they marked off the higher life were captured by a priesthood of impresarios. Modernism was thereafter routinized and deprived of its point. Artists ceased to defend themselves from kitsch and adopted it instead in a preemptive form. He also calls this a preemptiness you know, this pretense, this, this, uh, this uh, preemptive 
uh, appropriation of the vulgar, the sentimental, the ugly, is um, in a way a pretense that there's something going on other than idiosyncratic uh, and quasi-nihilistic self-expression. Um, so uh, um, it's clear that, I mean, this is a very severe judgment and we have to acknowledge it as such. Scruton argues that so much, not all, but so much of modern high culture is debased. It's, uh, it no longer uh, has the, um, the memory, the remembrance of the higher things that informed high modernism at the beginning and it's reduced the major part of itself to pretense. So uh, I think, you know, very interesting, very synoptic and comprehensive chapter, but one with um, very hard hitting analysis and evaluation. Chapter nine, uh, surface and surfeit um, has, um, begins with a discussion of photography and the threat that photography posed to art. Um, and Scruton really challenges the assumption that some early 20th century philosophers like the Italian Benedetto Croce, a very interesting idealist philosopher, or the uh, English uh, philosopher R.J. Collingwood, they both assume that, well, things like photography could capture the thing in itself. It could represent objects and persons. So the task of art had to be something different, not representation, uh, but instead the sort of emotion that flows from it, or perhaps some uh, active communication of the inward life. But Scruton explicitly says this argument is wrong. And it's wrong because, as he puts it, and I'm not going to lay out the whole argument, that photography, in fact, represents nothing. Um, it is not an art of depiction. And that art, properly understood, not in its either kitschy or relativistic postmodern forms, is really not about, um, uh, it's, not, it's not about e e uh, uh, representation at all. Um, so it scrutins, and I think this is a, a view shared by some of the high modernists and by, you might say, the, the, the world of culture before high modernism. Literature and painting represent things, not by copying them, but by expressing thoughts about them. And by the way, I think Scruton's critique of the representation, the claim that photography has a representation, representational character could be applied very well also to everything associated with the internet. Uh, I'm sure many of you had the same reaction I did when you were rereading these pages in the last few days that uh, how much more Scruton could have said about the false depictions and false representations that inform the, the pretense underlying the World Wide Web or uh, uh, that somehow this gives us access to true communication, true art, true self-expression, et cetera. One of one, of course, Scruton lived till 2020, and he had many, <laughs> many things to say about all that, and not, uh, and a, as I suggest, but this this analysis, one doesn't really need the additional analysis. One can infer it from um, from something like this chapter, among others. Um, all right, um, I should add that chapter nine contains. Um, quite interesting and suggestive remarks about uh, photography as attempting to realize the thing desired. And a large, this is true of the internet too, a large part of photography um, has deflected the human capacities of imaging and reflecting toward uh, the sexual and the violent. And so, when photography or the internet does that, there's something inherently pornographic about it. And um, both the photography and the internet are here to stay as Scruton insists, but um, 
when we think about their role in realizing and validating violence in the SECT Act, and we see how um, our humanity and our sexuality are increasingly and radically divorced from any ethical view of, of the human condition or of, of personhood, then we see that um, these vehicles uh, for some, some sort of enhanced representation and de depiction become very, very problematic. And uh, that reminds me, of, for those of you who are interested, I think many of you are in sort of the broader cultural and philosophical reflection of Scruton, and we already saw him treat this theme in the early chapter. He, the disenchantment of human sexuality, which leads us into chapter 10 on the youth culture, it really is part of the debasement of personhood, an essential part of this desacralization of individual and collective life. Um, we would not worship the young and the experiences felt in a rather chaotic and undisciplined way by the young if sexuality had not been comprehensively disenchanted or shorn of a uh, a context that humanizes it. And if you're interested, it's like 500 pages long, but I would recommend Rogers' 1986 book, or is it 1985 book, Sexual Desire. It's a difficult philosophical book, but it provides a kind of phenomenology of sexual desire and uh, how quickly something elevating and the source of human communion can degenerate into profanation or what Scruton in his, um, book of several years ago on human nature calls moral pollution. Again, he's not writing like uh, a member of the League of Decency or uh, uh, some you know, feminist activist against uh, male dominated pornography, he's simply pointing out that our humanity is risk at risk if we cease to tie um, sexuality to broader moral purposes and to what uh, Burke and Babbitt called the uh, moral imagination. Um, so euthanasia, I, I like the title. The title. Um, uh, you know, some of the uh, pop culture references are no doubt dated. Who watches MTV anymore? Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't, I don't think they make videos very often anymore. Um, some of the groups have seen better days, Nirvana, REM. The Prodigy and Oasis, by the way, compared to a lot of the stuff out there today, some of that stuff, some of that kind of cultic pop looks pretty darn good. Um, but Scruton has some um, really good discussions, I think, of this faux religiosity, uh, or this faux, well, it's a real quest for meaning, but it's distorted and dehumanized. And for example, he talks about how so much of the, so many of the lyrics, and of course there are exceptions, uh, but so many of the lyrics and standard popularized rock and pop music, or I guess we could add rap today, it's a strangulated cry for human meaning, maybe protest, but it is singularly inarticulate. Uh, what, what's missing is a lyric and a harmony and a rhythm that can, you know, the classics thought music educated the soul. You know, Aristotle ends the eighth book of his politics with a discussion of music. Musical education is an essential part of liberal education. Uh, Scruton, a little bit like Alan Bloom in the closing of the American point, uh, mind points out that these these uh, quasi-religious uh, figures from popular music, they're, they're divinized in a secular ersatz way and they never grow up. You know, Mick Jagger still strutting the stage. Uh, uh, you know, Michael Jackson, God knows Michael Jackson, what was that? You know, he ceased to be a black man. He was sexually ambiguous. He, you know, dreamed of some Peter Pan existence, but there's, um, there's some strange um, effort, to, you know, when people search for meaning in the youth culture, 
um, in such an inarticulate way, um, something essential gets lost. And um, that's good. I think it's, it's very easy to say this is cranky and he's a, uh, you know, Alan Bloom once said, people will come up to him about his chapter on, on popular music and rock and roll and the closing of the American mind and say, yeah, you're, you're broadly right, but what about Duran Duran? What about this group? What about that group? You know, and no doubt one could do that with Scruton too. But his discussion of the way the youth culture valorizes mo the modern ad adolescent, the way that this inarticulate faux spiritual impulse becomes the dominant spiritual form for so many people. I think there's much truth in it and it's very striking. Let's look at page 109, uh, top of the page. Um, this is a, um, I think some helpful remarks. The modern adolescent finds himself in a world that has been set in motion. He is beset by noise, by external pressures and by forces he cannot control. The pop star is displayed in the same condition high up on electric wires, the currents of modern life zinging through him, but miraculously unharmed. He is the guarantee of safety, the living symbol that you can live like this forever. His death or decay are simply inconceivable like the death of Elvis, or if conceivable, understood as a sacrificial offering, a prelude to resurrection like the death of Kurt Cobain. From Nirvana, of course. Um, very powerful passage, and uh, you, one might say, yeah, well, maybe Scruton exaggerates a bit, but not by much. And um, the, the worship of adolescence, by the way, as sort of the ideal moment in human life, and maybe the moment that gives us the proper attitude of undirected, un unhumanized sexual desire as the, the sort of goal of existence, this is all problematic, you know, deeply problematic sort of worship of youth and the failure to see, um, um, you know, on page 111, Scruton points out that popular icons have, uh, popular musicians have always been idolized. You know, he says, all you have to do is think about Frank Sinatra or Bing Crosby. But he adds those old style icons grew up in time passed over from adolescence to adulthood, became mellow, avuncular, and religion. religious. I don't know how uh, religious uh, Frank Sinatra ever became, but Bing Crosby uh, made much of his Catholicity. Uh, and I think broadly speaking, taking into account perhaps an element of hyperbole, the modern pop star does not grow up. He grows sideways like Mick Jagger or Michael Jackson becoming waxy and encrusted as though covered by a much repainted mask. Um, and uh, all you have to do, by the way, is look at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame every year to see, you know, cheap trick at 80, singing the old songs and all of this. It's, uh, there is something uh, strange about this pseudo immortality and this, uh, desire never to grow up and to present that uh, antinomian and fallacious and fantastic desire as somehow the goal of human existence. So all of this, and I think this is really important to bring this back to culture and the sacred. These are all substitutes for the rites of passage that have informed every hitherto existing society traditional and modernist. Um, so no longer are erotic feelings regarded as a preparation for marriage and duly sublimated. Even Freud thought sublimation was necessary. If you read a book like Civilization and its discontents. But what triumphed in the Western world was a vulgarized Freudianism that says all repression is wrong. Sock it to me, baby, let it all hang out, as they said in a song in, the, uh, in a uh, comedy show in the late 1960s. So um, I think Scruton's really deep point is made on page 113. 
that for modern adolescents, there's no tribal membership. Tribal membership, if you know Scruton's writings, is problematic. It's not political membership. It's not religious membership. It's something in between. But nor is there the membership of being in a city or, chi city or chivitas. Instead, uh, one lives in a sort of protected pseudo-bourgeois world where the elementary experiences of life, religion, citizenship, being a soldier, they just are not part of the bonds of social membership. Television, we could add the internet more and more inform the imagination. Um, but to come back more and more, um, it's fewer and fewer young people and adults see erotic feelings as a preliminary to marriage or see as Scruton, I think very nicely puts it, the partial servitude of commitment and belonging as a very acceptable costs for living a life of communion, community, belonging. Um, and if sex becomes, as Scruton suggests, a permanently and intrinsically adolescent experience, and if everything that reminds us of our competences and responsibilities are dismissed as judgmental, hierarchical, and oppressive, then we're in trouble. And, uh, you know, I think Scruton, like many of us, believes that fundamentally human nature is not changeable. Uh, you know, there are heroes, there are saints, there are those supreme examples of self overcoming. But, you know, the fundamental human desires for meaning, membership, et cetera, don't go away. People still want to overcome solitude. They still want to love. They go to the, the football um, hooligans uh, show us that the old tribal feelings and the gods of war don't die so easily. But if you just think about it for a minute, a youth culture that is so valorized by people who want to know better, the forced and really stupid confusion of authority and hierarchy with authoritarianism, all of this understand, under, undermines the possibility of a serious human life informed by commitment, moral obligation, moral imagination. And so what happens, Scruton suggests, is um, we valorize experiences, sexual and otherwise, artistic, self-expressive, and I'm going to quote here, which involve no cost in terms of education, moral discipline, hardship, or love. And I think he very suggestively remarks that the paradigm for this is drug taking, a pleasure divorced from all the goods and competencies of life. By the way, as I understand it, one of the great points made by Aristotle, Aristotle's not against pleasure in his ethics. He never reduces the good to the pleasant, but uh, good things are accompanied by pleasures. But what's unacceptable is the search for pleasure shorn of any activities or goods. Uh, uh, you know, so drug taking or gratuitous sex or, uh, you know, uh, the joy of the knife or all these things here. A search for pleasure disconnected from the goods that give substance and content to life and therefore give meaning to pleasure. Um, so Scruton goes on to suggest that um, this euthanasia is really has more to do with fantasy and illusion than to recur to a phrase I've used several times to moral imagination. Um, I'll end here, but there's some very um, interesting discussions of the role that dancing played in traditional culture, even in contemporary culture until 50, 60 years ago, where dancing was seen as tied to social intentionality, to, uh, I love those old fashioned words, courtesy and courtship, courtship. The idea of courting a woman uh, or wooing her, you know, through ritual activities. There's a wonderful movie, Brooklyn, some of you may have seen based on a novel by uh, an Irish novelist about some Irish immigrant women who come over from 
Ireland in the early 1950s, live in Brooklyn. This Irish immigrant girl falls in love with an Italian plumber, Italian American plumber. But uh, um, they meet at a parish dance on Friday night. He likes Irish girls. She uh, is looking for a man. And, uh, but there's, there's uh, rituals associated with this. It's not one night stands. It's not meeting the mother of your children or father of your children at a bar. It's, uh, it's the, uh, now this may not have been the uh, ritualized folk dances and the rites of passages of a more traditional society, but it was still an understanding that dances should not be formless and violent that um, sexual pleasure is connected to wider and deeper and broader goods. One final comment, uh, Scruton near the end of the chapter, Euthanasia talks about the lack of a common culture. And he brings us back to that theme that we need culture, we need belonging, uh, we need sexuality, All, but if we don't get it in the right form, we're gonna get it in these ersatz forms. And he talks about the bizarre sanctification and cult of Princess Diana. Um, Princess Diana was a troubled soul. Um, she did no more charity than any other member of the royal family. She, you know, much of her behavior, and I'm, I'm, you could blame Prince Charles too, but much of it was transgressive, you know, ha you know hanging out at the bars late at night and all of this, and, and very self-expressive, you know, making public the sordid personal lives of the uh, Prince of Wales and his wife, but she was turned into uh, a secular saint in a weird ritual of grieving and ostentation. And, uh, and as Scruton points out, it was all presided over by Elton John at Westminster Cathedral, rewriting his old song from a 1972 rock album, you know, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, uh, English Rose, you know. Oh, by the way, I, I you know, Princess Diana is um, many people, her death was tragic, etc. But is she really any more than an expression of ersatz sentimentality, of a kind of sentimental kitsch, of a kind of cult of, of uh, sanctification, uh, uh, you know, shorn of any elevating or transcendental references? So, um, all of this is extremely countercultural, but it's wise. And I would say that anyone who reads these chapters with an open mind will see Ryder Scruton has earned his judgments. He himself is an extremely cultivated man, a man of moral imagination, a man whose judgments will sometimes hard hitting, or earned, or calibrated, or morally serious, et cetera, et cetera. So, I just tried to do my best in the last uh, uh, 40 minutes to sort of lay out, uh, 50 minutes, 55 minutes to lay out some of the principal themes, how they connect. But again, the movement from the essential connection from culture and the sacred to um, high modernism, and then eventually to a kind of postmodernism or even the memory of the sacred is forgotten but you might say the wellsprings of the soul still have their needs and they take increasingly troubling, idiosyncratic and mindless forms. I'll leave it at that, thanks.